All right, welcome back. This is the final episode of my Wuthering Heights A Reader's Guide series. Making this series took a lot of time and effort, but I've really enjoyed sharing my analyses of one of my favourite books, and I'll definitely be carrying on with different books in the future too. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the supernatural side of Wuthering Heights. Is Cathy's ghost real? Is Heathcliff a real person, or is he a spirit created by Catherine? Is Heathcliff a human being, or is he a spirit of the Moors? And is Catherine the witch that summoned him? These are some of the supernatural questions we'll be looking at in today's video. What I like about Wuthering Heights is that it's a story that can be analysed as purely realistic with no magic at all. It can be analysed symbolically, or it can be analysed in a very magical way, and these are the things that I want to come to grips with in today's video. Part 1. Dreams and Ghosts So the most obvious supernatural element in the story is the famous ghost scene at the very beginning where Cathy's ghost seems to come to Wuthering Heights during the night to visit Lockwood and she begs him to let her in. What's so fantastic about this scene is how well Bronte constructs it, because she constructs it in such a way that it is really hard to know whether it's real or not. Just before Lockwood sees the ghost, he has this dream sequence that we talked about back in episode 4. Bronte makes it really clear in this dream sequence that the images of the dream have been informed by Lockwood's recent experiences. The preacher who turns up in the dream is a preacher who he was reading about just before he went to bed, and Joseph, who appears in the dream, is a character or a person who he's just met. A similar thing happens with the ghost scene. Before falling asleep, Lockwood finds Catherine's diary, but he also sees scratched on the windowsill three names. Catherine Earnshaw, Catherine Heathcliff, Catherine Heathcliff, Catherine Linton. It's within reason then that Lockwood is imposing these names and these images onto his dreams, and this applies even with the ghost scene. Because he's been reading and learning about Catherine, he then has a hallucination of Catherine. But then Bronte does something that casts doubt on this just being a dream with Lockwood's mind just recycling old things. When the ghost arrives, she reveals her name as Catherine Linton. Lockwood casts doubt on the idea that this image of Catherine is a dream. He says, Why did I think of Linton? I had read Earnshaw 20 times for Linton. Now this isn't concrete evidence that Catherine's ghost is real, but it certainly casts doubt on the idea, because it seems that if the ghost was just a product of Lockwood's imagination, then it would have the name that was most on his mind, and not the one that he didn't really think about. So let's go with the interpretation then that Catherine's ghost is real, and think, why would Catherine introduce herself as Catherine Linton and not Catherine Heathcliff, given that she's supposed to have loved Heathcliff and not really loved Hint Linton in the end? Another question is why does she appear as a child and not as the woman that she was when she died? One interpretation for the Linton name might be that Catherine, in death, ultimately does identify with the Lintons. She sees the wrong that she did and she feels bad, and so now she sees herself as belonging to the Lintons. And perhaps then Catherine is here not to see Heathcliff, but to protect her daughter, Cathy, from Heathcliff. I'm not very convinced by this interpretation, just because there's nothing in Catherine's nature that suggests that she would have such a dramatic character shift, even in death. There's very little evidence in Catherine's life that she's particularly maternal. Obviously, we don't really get to see her with child, but she doesn't seem to be particularly maternal. And while she's dying, she still seems consumed by her desire for Heathcliff and not Edgar. Also, this interpretation doesn't really explain why Catherine would come back to Wuthering Heights as a child and not as a grown woman. A second interpretation of the story, and the one which I prefer, is that Catherine comes as a child because she does actually still identify with Heathcliff, and she wants to come back to Wuthering Heights. The last time that Catherine and Heathcliff were really a unit together was when they were children, and they were on that night on the moors where they first saw the Lintons. That was when everything changed. It was when they first saw the Lintons and Catherine stayed with them that the tension in their relationship began to emerge. That time, when Catherine looked through the window and she was let in, she became somewhat a Linton. Now, having died, she's coming back to Wuthering Heights as a child because she wants to be let in a second time, but this time she wants to come back to Wuthering Heights. The fact that she calls herself Cathy Linton is because that's where she was when she died. She is still a Linton, but she wants to come back to Wuthering Heights, and that's why she's banging on the window, begging desperately to be let inside. She wants to be an Earnshaw again. I like this interpretation because it explains both why she's called Linton and why she's a child. It was when she was a child that she was a true Earnshaw, 
and as she grew up she moved to the side of the Lintons and became one and now she's coming back as a Linton as a child trying to get back into that old state that she was happy in. Another thing to ask about Kathy's ghost is why is it that she comes to Lockwood assuming that she's real and not anyone else? If the ghost has a power to come back and knock on windows why not go to Heathcliff who would clearly just let you in you know quite happy to let you in. Lockwood seems to think that the ghost has malicious intentions. If the little fiend had got in at the window she would have strangled me. So he seems to think that the ghost wants to kill him. But why would Cathy's ghost want to strangle Lockwood? What would be in it for her if she killed him? In her critical essay of Wuthering Heights Camille Parlier points out that there is a spiritual belief about ghosts that if a ghost is able to kill a person, a living person, then that ghost can take their life and come back to life. And Parlier uses this mystical belief as a way of suggesting that that's what Cathy's ghost is intending to do. She's coming back to live at Lockwood's expense. And for Parlier, the reason why Cathy appears as a child rather than as a grown woman is to encourage him to open the window because obviously if it's a child knocking on the window you're going to be much more likely to open the door to it. I like this and the previous interpretation as Cathy as a ghost that's a malevolent force trying to come back to life and using Lockwood as a conduit so that she can live again. It's more in keeping with Catherine's nature and her relationship with Heathcliff. It makes sense that she wouldn't appear to Heathcliff if her intention was to live at someone else's expense because she wouldn't want to kill Heathcliff. It also makes the scene much more harrowing and dark if that's what she's doing which I always appreciate especially in a book like Wuthering Heights which is a dark violent book. Part 2 Catherine and Heathcliff Twin Sexed Souls One of my favourite quotes about the connection between Catherine and Heathcliff comes from Emile Montague who says He and she are, so to speak, but a single person. Together they form a hybrid monster, twin sexed and twin souled. He is the male soul of the monster, she the female. Throughout Wuthering Heights Catherine and Heathcliff are always making connections between how entwined their bodies and souls are. Catherine does this in her famous I am Heathcliff speech but Heathcliff also does it at one point too. When Catherine is dying Heathcliff screams out how am I going to live without my soul? And this is a point echoed by Catherine too because at one point she basically says if she were to die and Heathcliff live then she would still be alive because he's there. So although Catherine does die at the end of volume 1 on this idea that Catherine and Heathcliff are somehow joined in a supernatural way and connected with each other you could see Catherine living on in Heathcliff either in a literal sense as part of this twin sex soul thing or at least in a metaphorical sense in that Catherine and her revenge becomes very much a part of Heathcliff for the rest of the story. After Catherine's death Heathcliff's character changes slightly. He becomes way more focused on his revenge and basically he's mindless outside of that. All he is interested in is getting revenge on the people that he thinks ruined Catherine's life. Metaphorically then you could say that Catherine is inside Heathcliff's mind driving him on to commit these vengeful acts because it's her only way of getting the revenge on the people that she couldn't get revenge on while she was living. If we take the connection between them more literally though we could say that Catherine as Heathcliff's self-described soul is now inside him and driving him to commit these acts of vengeance. There's definitely something both not quite human about both Catherine and Heathcliff. Heathcliff has this mysterious birth where we never actually learn where he comes from. It's as if he really could have just come up and sprung out from the moors. And Catherine, although she does have a natural birth, has this strange spiritual connection to the moors. When she's in her death throes she's begging Nellie to open up the windows so that she can be blasted by the wind. Now for most human beings being blasted by the elements would not be good for their health but for Catherine it really does seem like she gets her energy from nature like some kind of swamp witch. Part 3 Who or what killed Heathcliff? Heathcliff's death is another really mysterious part of Wuthering Heights. His death actually in some ways seems to mirror Catherine's death in that both of them spend lots of time in bed kind of starving themselves until eventually they waste away. Now there is a very naturalistic interpretation of Heathcliff's death which is well before his death he keeps going out onto the moors at night and so he gets sick and this is eventually what kills him. But this is kind of out of keeping with Heathcliff's character because like Catherine he's someone who has always got his energy from nature and the moors. So I don't think that fully explains what's going on here. I think a better way of analysing Heathcliff's death is to think about it in more psychological terms or given that in this video we're focusing on magic, supernatural terms. 
In the previous section, we looked at how Catherine and Heathcliff and their identities are somewhat embedded in each other. Heathcliff has Catherine's soul and Catherine has Heathcliff's and their personalities are entwined. It's my view then that when Catherine dies, she enters Heathcliff in a more fundamental way, either just psychologically in terms of her death impacting his psychology, or if we're going with the more magical interpretation, literally. Now Catherine at her death is vengeful, and if we take this idea that Catherine is Heathcliff's soul seriously, then it seems like Cathy's vengeance is now going to imbue Heathcliff with his fundamental drive. And this is certainly what happens in the context of the story. So whether we take the psychological explanation that Catherine's death is just fueling Heathcliff's vengeance, or we take a more mystical explanation of Cathy's soul is now possessing Heathcliff, certainly his character from the point of her death on is hellbent on revenge. And this all comes crashing down, obviously, when Hareton and Cathy get together, and, he and Heathcliff sees that his vengeance is no longer going to have its effect. It's at this point in the story when Heathcliff starts to weaken. Not when he starts going out onto the moors, but when he sees that the next generation have broken the cycle of revenge. And so you could view this as a sort of mystical spell being broken. Catherine's spell of revenge that was created when she died is broken because these two have resisted it. Or on a more psychological level, Heathcliff has just realised that he's lost. He's no longer able to create misery in the world because the world doesn't care about him anymore. Cathy and Hurton have got together and it doesn't really matter to them what Heathcliff does from that point on. And so ultimately that's what kills him. So on this magical interpretation of Heathcliff's death, Heathcliff dies because Catherine's spirit is done with him. The revenge is over and there's a union between the Earnshaws and the Lintons. Although it's worth pointing out that ultimately it's the Earnshaws that win because obviously given the time period, Cathy will take Hurton's name which means at the end of the story, the Linton family is actually wiped out and it's the Earnshaw name that will carry on. So clearly in a roundabout way, there would be some satisfaction in that for Catherine, the evil ghost. Perhaps Catherine the ghost orchestrated all of this. Maybe she wanted her daughter to marry Hareton and continue the Earnshaw line. Now, of course, we'll never know if Catherine's ghost was really there in the story, but I think that there is one thing that we can know about Catherine's ghost, which is that it does appear at the end of the story, and it is the cause of Heathcliff's death. Here is how Nellie describes the scene of Heathcliff's dead body in his room. And the thing to note is how similar this scene is to the scene that Lockwood describes when Cathy's ghost arrives at the beginning of the story. The following evening was very wet. Indeed, it poured down till day dawn, and... As I took my morning walk round the house, I observed the master's window swinging open and the rain driving straight in. He cannot be in bed, I thought. Those showers would drench him through. He must be either up or out. But I'll make no more ado. I'll go boldly and look. Having succeeded in obtaining entrance with another key, I ran to unclose the panels, for the chamber was vacant. Quickly, pushing them aside, I peeped in. Mr Heathcliff was there, laid on his back, his eyes met mine, so keen and fierce. I started, and then he seemed to smile. I could not think him dead, but his face and throat were washed with rain. The bedclothes dripped, and he was perfectly still. The lattice, flapping to and fro, had grazed one hand that rested on the sill. No blood trickled from the broken skin, and when I put my fingers to it, I could doubt no more. He was dead and stark. I hasped the window. I combed his black long hair from his forehead. I tried to close his eyes, to extinguish, if possible, that frightful, lifelike gaze of exultation before anyone else beheld it. They would not shut. They seemed to sneer at my attempts, and his parted lips and sharp white teeth sneered too. Taken with another fit of cowardice, I cried out for Joseph. Joseph shuffled up and made a noise, but resolutely refused to meddle with him. The open window is the most obvious connection between this scene and the scene with Lockwood. But unlike Lockwood, who keeps the window shut, therefore stopping Cathy from coming in and killing him, Heathcliff opens the window and lets Cathy in. Of course, just as all the other explanations for the supernatural stuff, there could be a naturalistic explanation for it. Heathcliff opens the window, it's cold, it makes him even more sick, and then he dies. But the way the scene is described, the way that the window has been opened this time, and now a death has occurred, kind of suggests that the ghost may well have come in and killed Heathcliff. And it makes sense that Catherine would kill Heathcliff at this point because the story is complete. The revenge has been had and there's nothing left to do except for them to be together. 
And obviously then we have the final suggestion of the supernatural at the very end of the story with the myths in the town of people saying that they've seen Catherine and Heathcliff, their ghosts, out on the moors. Part 5 Conclusion In this video we've examined some of the supernatural elements of Wuthering Heights. We've looked at Catherine's ghost, the mystical connection between her and Heathcliff, and finally Heathcliff's death. Bronte is just a wonderfully ambiguous writer. She tells a story which can have mystical interpretations, but she always crafts things in such a way where there are always natural explanations as well. And this is fantastic because it just means there's so much more to get from the story. Wuthering Heights can be seen in a supernatural way, in a metaphorical way, or in a psychological way. There's really no end to the different ways that you could interpret it. It's kind of like what I said in my video about the theme of religion in Wuthering Heights. It can be interpreted in that way, but it doesn't have to be. And that's why the book has such a great and lasting appeal. Well, that's it for this video, and that's it for my book series on Wuthering Heights. I'm thinking that I'll probably be doing a new reader's guide soon, and at the moment I'm thinking that Dracula might be the book that I pick. So if you're into Dracula and you enjoy Dracula, then be on the lookout for my Dracula Reader's Guide series coming very soon. Please let me know what you think about this episode and what you thought about the Wuthering Heights series altogether. I definitely want to look for ways to improve these series, so if there are things that you think that I could do better in the future, please let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and the series, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. I upload new videos every week on Mondays and Thursdays. But that's it for this video though, so take care everyone. Ta-ra!